Hey guys, happy Saturday. Welcome to another video. Today we're going to be discussing the US-China trade war and hopefully demystifying a few things because it is, I think, very confusing and all the different elements of it. Um, so tensions have been uh, rising between the two world's largest economies and they spiked in recent weeks. Uh, and officials on both sides are suggesting now that a hard-won trade deal uh, that basically diffused an 18-month trade war could be abandoned months after it was signed in January. So I know January feels like a long time ago. Um, we've all been in lockdown and uh, felt the wrath of the coronavirus. Um, but this is now leading uh, to the trade war um, increasing in intensity uh, yet again. Uh, and investors were holding their breath all week, um, waiting for Donald Trump's uh, press conference that happened on Friday night. So thanks, Donald. Really wanted to spend my night waiting for your press conference. Uh, and actually, it was a, a disappointment. I think disappointment if you were, uh, one, expecting there to be fireworks, um, a good thing for equity uh, holders. So um, Trump basically came out and said, our actions will be strong, uh, but reasonable. He basically pulled back uh, from the who um, and um, was actually quite soft, to be honest. Um, and I think investors obviously took that um, in their stride. And he said he's not planning to scrap the phase one trade deal. Um, and yeah, investors moved on. Um, but do expect uh, and kind of be protected if you can um, from retaliation from China, because I think that is uh, definitely to come. Um, it is a political exercise at the end of the day. It's no coincidence that Trump has started to strum up, um, you know, the China talk um, because the stock markets are all time highs and he bangs the drum um, when he looks good. Right. He, did you hear anything about um, China uh, and the tensions between the two um, when there's, when we were at the March 23rd lows? Of course you didn't, because um, he's got a few uh, kind of uh, feathers in his cap that he likes to roll out to strum up his voters, uh, one being China, one being the stock stock market. Um, so the stock markets are all time high. So now he has the, the wiggle room to take fire uh, at China. And in amongst the devastation that coronavirus has caused to the real economy, you know, this is an easy target. China is an easy target. Millions are unemployed. Uh, and given the emotional nature of this virus, I think, and the kind of pain that it's caused, it's going to um, definitely stimulate a lot of bad feelings, uh, a lot of nationalist feelings, I think, um, in uh, not just the United States, but in Europe as well. Um, and I think this is, you know, a really big risk uh, to global GDP and obviously then stock markets, even though the stock market doesn't seem to care about the real economy at the moment, there will be a point uh, where um, it has to. Um, so the big risk is protectionist measures um, being stimulated again. Um, but um, as you know, the United States start to unwind the lockdown measures, uh, and as we kind of uh, progress to the no November uh, 2020 election date, um, he's going to further alienate uh, China. And uh, as the stock markets at all time highs, he's got more wiggle room uh, to do that. We have to talk about the virus um, because since the pandemic originated in Wuhan, um, there's been increasing accusations that China failed to control the virus at inception, um, with some comments coming out of the, the White House and Washington and Trump uh, claiming that Chinese scientists um, potentially created the virus. And of course, we're never going to know that. And uh, I don't really have an opinion on that. Um, to be honest, we'll never know anyway. Um, but what Trump's done is use this and called it the Chinese virus. Of course, we know that a pandemic and a virus cannot have, um, you know, um, can't be assigned to a country. Um, but this is what is going to he's going to use to stimulate his core voters um, as well. And JP Morgan have uh, definitely uh, uh, written in their note recently, the increased chance of politicization, politicization, sorry, of the coronavirus pandemic and blaming it on an ethnic group or a country is just such a convenient excuse for basically failings at home, you know, wrong policies, um, all the people that are unemployed, the income inequality, the wealth inequality. Um, and, you know, it's an easy excuse. But the big risk is 
that it provides a pretext uh, to push a geopolitical uh, or protectionist agenda. Um, and this is um, paired with the coronavirus as we kind of uh, step into that kind of chance of a second wave, but also the recovery really of the real economy as people do go back to work. Um, you know, the consumer and lots of um, economic data points were relatively strong heading into the virus. If you're talking about unemployment, uh, the consumer, um, things like that. So it's not going to take too much time to recover. The only thing stopping it, of course, is the big thing um, that is the lockdowns. Um, but the rolling back of globalization, which is definitely a trend that I think we're going to see, uh, and the politicization of this virus could um, lead to equities uh, rolling over. And this is easy be to kind of use because um, there's been more than uh, or at least 100,000 American deaths, far more than what China have reported. And of course, um, it's uh, a well-known fact that Chinese data um, can be um, somewhat uh, elusive at times. Um, so that number is likely to be uh, higher. But of course, this stimulates uh, a lot of kind of bad feelings. Um, so Trump is terminating the relationship with the, the WHO. And he's basically said that the cover up of the virus has cost lives in the US uh, and elsewhere. Um, Hong Kong is another really sensitive uh, subject. So on Thursday, uh, Beijing's Politburo Standing Committee officially wove a new national security law uh, in the Hong Kong constitution, taking advantage of basically this loophole uh, that required Hong Kong uh, to always have a national security law on its books. Uh, and many have uh, decreed that the move as crossing of the Rubicon, that Beijing no longer cares about um, it's placating its Western allies uh, as it cracks down on the freedoms of the territories that it basically claims. Uh, and Trump basically come out yesterday and said that they're going to uh, act to revoke Hong Kong's preferential treatment uh, and order the uh, and Trump orders the begin of the process of eliminating uh, the Hong Kong uh, exemptions. Um, so the Hong Kong issue is putting additional strain on this kind of U.S.-China uh, relationship, uh, relationship um, risking. Uh, a renewed flare-up again, um, further downward pressure on the renminbi, uh, and a, an acceleration um, of the U.S.-China uh, decoupling. Uh, and U.S. lawmakers are pushing uh, the president to hit China with sanctions or other measures uh, for its increasing grip. So China's increasing grip uh, on Hong Kong and human rights uh, abuses toward the minority uh, Muslims. And Pompeo's come out of the Washington uh, out of Washington and said on Wednesday that Hong Kong has effectively lost its autonomy and no longer warrants its special treatment that it gets uh, under U.S. law. Uh, and this declaration essentially opens up the door uh, for Trump to impose penalties ranging from modest sanctions uh, to try and curb uh, China's actions against its kind of uh, territory uh, to re revoking Hong Kong's uh, special trading status. Um, so, of course, China's going to uh, vow to hit back uh, at the U.S., um, while moving ahead with the national security leg legislation over uh, Hong Kong. Um, but this is more fuel uh, to the fire, and we're seeing investors fleeing Hong Kong. The Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the US dollar, um, just uh, to put it out there. Um, more, um, you know, more investors are actually fleeing Hong Kong, selling their once really valuable uh, real estate, um, and it's the Hong Kong dollar is trading towards a stronger end uh, of its band against uh, the US dollar uh, as the dollar weakened against the euro uh, and several over its major rivals. So Hong Kong residents, uh, and this is coming out of Bloomberg, have been exchanging more of Hong Kong dollars holdings, uh, their Hong Kong dollar holdings into foreign currencies at banks uh, and money exchange counters. Uh, of course, the trade war, um, basically Trump has said that um, you know, they're going to keep the phase one uh, trade deal intact, at least for now. Um, but of course, this spells really bad um, kind of connotations for US companies with significant exposure uh, to China. So for example, uh, simple screen, 40% of uh, revenue generated in China, companies like Dell, Texas Instruments, monolithic power systems, they're going to reel at these uh, increased uh, tensions as well. Any Chinese uh, companies listed in the United States um, are definitely, you know, they're going to be toast, uh, in my opinion. So uh, companies like uh, Alibaba, 
Um, recently, the U.S. Senate has passed a bill to delist these Chinese companies, uh, which obviously has implications uh, for companies like Alibaba being barred from being listed in the United States. Uh, and this new bill essentially requires companies uh, to certify that they're not under the control uh, of a foreign government. Uh, and last year, obviously, in 2019, when trade war tensions were kind of at their peak, uh, Washington, Washington banned U.S. firms from doing business with Huawei. Um, short seller Carson Block, uh, Muddy Waters Research, um, he believes that um, the majority uh, of um, Chinese companies listed in the United States um, are committing some level of fraud with around 30 to 50 percent of revenues being fictitious. Um, he does believe that there are some good Chinese companies, of course, um, but there are some kind of short opportunities there um, as the kind of auditing standards that uh, take place in China um, are somewhat more relaxed uh, than uh, in the United States. So Kudlow again um, said that, um, re reinforced the point that the phase one trade deal is going to continue for the moment. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's pro progress there. But um, I think this will be the case, you know, kind of up until November, as um, bearing in mind where the stock market is. Um, but as we kind of, you know, go past the election, then he'll come down um, with the hammer. Uh, in my my opinion. Um, again, the currency war, this was August 2019 when it broke that kind of symbolic seven level. Um, the kind of the yuan is not freely traded, um, of course, and the government limits its uh, movement against the United States dollar. So another element of this kind of US-China um, kind of conflict um, is that China does actively manipulate its currency um, to make its exports more attractive. Um, so this was um, when the kind of yuan fell below seven in August. Uh, it's now about 7.2, um, but this was the lowest um, since 2008. Um, and this is going to be another um, kind of thing that, that, that everyone's going to focus on. Um, it keeps um, its yuan low to, to keep export prices low. Um, compared to the United uh, States dollar, um, but also invest heavily um, in the U US treasuries as well. Um, so, okay, um, China has accumulated um, lots of, you know, a huge amount of US treasuries over the last few decades. Uh, as of around uh, December 2019, um, they owned 1 trillion or about 5% of the 23 trillion, of course, that's a lot more, um, US national debt, far more uh, than any uh, other um, country. Um, but some analysts and investors are fearing, um, of course, that they could China could dump these treasuries in retaliation. And this isn't a new thing, but how this essentially works is it essentially weaponizes them, um, the treasury holdings. And this would essentially, um, putting more supply into the market, would send interest rates uh, higher, uh, hurting economic growth. Um, but of course, remember, we've got this coronavirus that's um, decimated the real economy. So this would be another really bad thing that, of course, um, they would want to avoid. Um, so dumping this 1.1 trillion uh, into the market. But on the flip side, Guggenheim's projections as a result of the coronavirus, of course, um, the government have been issuing lots of treasuries uh, to finance um, you know, the recovery. Um, so there's going to be five trillion in debt issuances uh, this calendar year, um, which could be conservative. Um, so another one trillion, you know, you think, um, what's another trillion? You've got the Fed to backstop this now. Um, and there would be more pressure uh, from Trump on Jerome Powell if this was the case. I do think this is unlikely, though. Um, of course, we need to look at uh, consumers uh, in the United States um, that are likely to contribute a lot to the recovery of the United States. But we had some data um, out and, they, and U.S. consumer spend, spending plunged in April uh, by the most on record. Um, and this was uh, as a result um, of the, the stimulus, stimulus payments being received, but actually saved. So incomes posted a 10.5% increase, uh, but outlays, so household expenditure, fell 13.6%. So it shows that the, the consumers of the United States aren't dumb. Um, they're doing the actual sensible thing, uh, even though this is not what, um, of course, what the, the Fed want and the government want consumers to be doing is saving these stimulus checks, for example. Um, and if you haven't, uh, if you don't, if you're not aware of a stimulus check, check the previous video that I've recorded. Um, and there's been some research that essentially the tariffs 
um, that you know uh, have been implemented, um, the U.S. are actually paying. Uh, and U.S. companies and consumers are paying almost the full cost of this. And this is coming out of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And this just came out, out in January. Um, so the United States consumers and companies are actually suffering from these tariffs, even though Trump and his senior advisors have basically insisted that China was paying the full cost of this. Um, so spending's fall, um, falling off a cliff and there was uh, not enough of an uptick or a recovery that we saw and savings is through the roof. Um, so this is something to be aware of. JP Morgan have, have advised now um, that they're going to start trimming back equities. And this is coming out of their strategist, Marco uh, Kalanovic, who actually caught the somewhat of the March bottom. And he's basically said that you should start trimming or they are starting to trim their equity holdings uh, and not because of the coronavirus, but actually as tensions heat up uh, as a result of US-China trade war. So they're dialing down their positive outlook of, on equities uh, and they'd like to see these uh, more of a normalization of these political uh, risks. Um, so this is another uh, risk to equities at the moment. And of course, um, I did a video a few months ago where equities are overvalued. They've been overvalued for a long time, uh, but expensive things tend to get more expensive and cheap things tend to stay cheap or get cheaper. Um, so the forward P multiple for the S&P 500 um, is now above 23. Um, so this is the highest since the early 2000s. Um, so more stress from a valuation valuation perspective, mid and small caps uh, are at all time high valuations uh, and so is leverage. Um, so there's been a huge amount of assumptions in this kind of equity market rally. And if you've caught the kind of jet fuel injected rally from the Federal Reserve, great. Um, but I think you always need to keep aware, uh, keep aware of the valuation. So there's more stress there and there's a lot of assumptions that are priced almost um, put for perfection. And what's been leading this rally uh, is these growth stocks. So Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, um, for example, and cyclicals really haven't participated, although they did for a bit um, the last five days or so, uh, and they remain very cheap. So it's always worth in amongst all of this kind of China, uh, US tensions, keeping in mind uh, valuations and what the smart money is doing in uh, in the context of these kind of US-China trade wars. So um, another increase in the net short position in the E-mini uh, S&P futures contracts. Um, and this is coming out of Bank of America confirmed that the trend of smart money is selling stocks with the bank's private net high net worth individuals, not only selling stock for seven consecutive weeks, but last week it recorded the largest week of equity selling since June 19th. Um, so what are private clients doing with this newly released cash? buying gold, uh, apparently, and other products, including healthcare, um, to, to basically hedge the coronavirus risk, uh, tips as an inflation hedge, and investment grade credit, which again, is uh, backstopped um, by the Fed. And there's an increasing risk of retail uh, investors um, basically lacking the analysis, but they're bidding up these battered stocks. So um, you've, I'm sure you've seen the, the Robin Hood top holdings are really just punters. Um, so American Airlines, Carnival, lots of cruise line op operators, some biotech stocks um, like uh, Moderna, which obviously is down around 40% uh, from that pop um, where they essentially... Uh, cured the had a vaccine and cured the coronavirus. Little um, did everyone know that it was only uh, eight uh, people and it wasn't very effective. Um, yet um, the owners of Moderna obviously uh, raised a lot of equity there. Who are the losers um, from this kind of coronavirus um, in fueled U.S.-China trade war uh, increase in tensions? Um, so there's. <laughs> No one benefits from a trade war, um, but Wall Street giants such as Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan have tens of billions of dollars uh, at stake uh, in China as political tensions rise um, of its 45 trillion financial market. So they have a combined 70.8 billion uh, to China uh, with JP Morgan alone plowing 19.2 billion in lending trading and investing a 10% increase. Um, but companies obviously with more exposure to China are more affected. Um, so Dell, as I mentioned before, um, despite um, all of this, um, they are the worst um, kind of impacted. Who are the winners? Um, so um, economists estimate that the trade war would shave more than 0.5% uh, off growth, uh, but some countries have benefited uh, in the fight. 
um, which redirected around 1.165 billion in trade. So analysts at Nomura identified Vietnam as a country that would uh, gain the most. The UN uh, identified Taiwan, Mexico, uh, and Vietnam. Uh, as we saw US orders ramp up last year. So um, there could be some good opportunities there. Um, the Fed also found that increased American imports boosted American, uh, sorry, Mexican economic growth by around 0.2%. Malaysia was another big winner from round one, taking around 1.8% market share uh, of the tariffs. Um, and it's shrinking the kind of the China's share of US import, imports. And again, there's lots of these peripheral Asian companies with cheap uh, supply chains like Vietnam, like India, uh, that are going to take a lot of share. Um, so there are winners, there are losers, but in general, no one really benefits from a trade war. But this is just going to be um, a kind of an ammunition tool um, that is used by Trump uh, heading into the election. Uh, so a lot covered there. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video uh, and have a good weekend.